Good morning. This is Dr. John Bennett broadcasting from dark Miami. Uh, this is another in the series of, of pediatric neurosurgery conferences, uh, Neurosurgical TV in collaboration with Deepak Gupta of the Department of Neurosurgery of the AIMS Hospital in New Delhi. We have the pleasure today of having a neurosurgical superstar, um, Ayip MD from Nepal, originally from India, but he's practicing now in Nepal. Uh, and uh, we're glad to have him here today. But first, let me introduce the panel before I introduce, before I turn over to Ayip. Good day, Francesca. Uh, good evening, Professor. I'm uh, Francesca Okia. I'm a fifth year medical student from Bucharest, Romania. And uh, I am really excited to see what Dr. Cherian has uh, to tell us about uh, pediatric trauma. Yes, pediatric uh, trauma. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Uh, I think th uh, this is a fascinating subject and this is something that uh, every doctor should know because we will encounter a, a traumatized ch uh, child at least once in our okay. practice. Very so good. Welcome, Francesca. So Welcome, and Dr. Uh, Gupta. Hi, welcome, I, and uh, I look forward to your talk on pediatric head injury. Uh, we all know that one third of the world population of children it lives in India, and uh, there is no part of the world which is immune to uh, traumatic injuries in children. And it will be very exciting to listen to your thoughts on how you uh, manage uh, children with traumatic brain injury. I look forward to your talk. Okay, very good. Okay, it's all yours, uh, I. Welcome. Yes. See, uh, morning, guys. It's an honor, uh, and thank you for inviting me, Deepak. So, uh, at the outset, I would like to tell you that my management of uh, pediatric head injuries uh, has not been the same as the rest of the world manages. For example, um, we have started off with this thing, cystinostomy, and so there's a lot of fundamental differences and a lot of change in beliefs that we have. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people may not accept it, uh, some may accept it. But I'm just going to tell uh, about our view of uh, treating pediatric head injuries. And I would invite Deepak because Deepak is an expert on uh, pediatric uh, head injuries. So I would also like to learn from Deepak as to how uh, he differs or how he manages things differently. So I would like to uh, start off by, let me start off by screen sharing, John. I hope... Uh, okay, let's we'll check it out. Yes, let's uh, share the entire screen. Okay. Uh, are you seeing not, my screen? No, not yet, not yet. You uh, click, you click share me, you're not sharing your PowerPoint. Okay. Are you seeing hey, my... Hey, yes, I am. Pediatric head injuries. Ah, right. And okay. let me know when you change slides I, to make sure you, the, we see the change also. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, yeah. before, let's get into the matter straight. How different is a pediatric head injury from other head injury? Uh, well, I mean, there's not much of difference, but there's a hell of a lot of difference too. How's that? Now, the first thing is an extradural or a, um, or a depressed fracture or any other kind of head injuries is different in pediatrics because, number one, the amount of blood loss can only be minimal. Not in surgery, even during the head injuries, there's a lot of uh, blood loss. By the time the child comes, hello, can you can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can yeah. hear you very well. Yes, we hello, we hear you, we hear you well. Yes. Yeah. So the amount of blood loss is a very important thing in pediatric head injuries. So uh, that's one thing you need to be taking care of in additional uh, to uh, how you would manage uh, adult head injuries. Now there's some bad news and good news as I have written. The bad news is 
you see this thing that uh, this pediatric brains they tend to swell up that too suddenly uh, without any without any hardly any structural damage and uh, if there's a subdural or something everything will be fine and suddenly they go for a massive swelling and when you open up there will be uh, you know the malignant brain edema as you put it I, I really see that in pediatric brains uh, I would like to uh, see what's uh, Deepak's view on that uh, but we don't give mannitol or we don't give any uh, hypertonic saline for these these patients I mean even when we are watching them and the PGCs is good we don't we don't give them any uh, prophylactic mannitol or hypertonic saline now the good news about pediatric head injuries is that the children's brain have amazing plasticity so if the child manages to survive the child usually does work so with this uh, background we will see what's usually done so usually you uh, do a ICP monitoring and ICP based management uh, most of this most of the head injuries are done managed conservatively and when there is a need we go for a decompressive uh, craniectomy or uh, lesionectomy and in my center we used to do that uh, for some time then we started doing decompressive uh, and cystinostomy and then now we do uh, cystinostomy alone now what's the difference the difference is very simple uh, Earlier we used to remove the bone and then we used to remove the bone as well as open the cisterns and now we remove the bone but after we open the cisterns and the brain is lax we put the bone back so I mean that's how we, we manage now let's look at the let's look at some proposed mechanisms uh, these two words, the CSF shift edema and lactate clearance, is uh, very important. I'll get to that once. Now, can you see that, John? Uh, hold on. I, uh, can you see the drawing? Yeah, uh, yeah not really. I, yes. No, no, no. What, what do you want to show? I. No, can you see the drawing? Yes, I can. And now that I see your drawing, yes. Everybody can? Yes. Okay. Right. So, just drawing the brain here. This is one thing I would want to discuss in detail. So, that's why uh, we would. So, we all know that the CSF gets secreted in the lateral ventricles, in the third ventricles, and the fourth ventricles. And then we also know that you have the cisterns here and all around too. The CSF space is all around. We have the cisterns here. So let me just uh, fill this up. Right. Now, one more thing that we know is there are vessels in here. Now, the vessels go from the cisterns into the brain and then they, they branch. Then you also have vessels along the brain and they branch too. Now, right. So, when let's say this is a normal brain, and let's say that there's trauma. So in trauma, what happens? 
the most common thing that happens in severe uh, head trauma is subarachnoid hemorrhage. So when you have subarachnoid hemorrhage, you have these small vessels bleeding into the cisterns. Well, there will be contusions. There may be subdurals. There may be convexity subarachnoid hemorrhages. But one of the most important thing for me, what happens is this, there's bleeding into the systems. And when the bleeding into the systems happen, what happens is the systemal pressure, the pressure in the systems, they go up. While, and they go up significantly because the pressure of the systems are usually about 10 to 15. And we are talking about a capillary bleed. We are not talking about pure arterial bleed. So let's say it goes to 50. The pressure in the brain, on the other hand, is going to remain, let's say, around 20. So there's a gradient between the cistern and the brain. Now cisterns are CSF, the brain itself is brain matter. Now do they communicate? That's been proven clearly with the G lymphatic system that the cisterns, they travel through the paravascular spaces. These are spaces accompanying the vessels. So they travel around the paravascular spaces to all parts of the brain. So if you take a vascular cast, that's exactly where your systems, I mean your CSF is too. And also that they communicate with the interstitial fluid of the brain. Uh, there are other functions of, for it too, but right now we know that this paravascular spaces carry CSF from the cisterns and they communicate with the interstitial ISF, brain ISF. They communicate with the brain ISF. Does the ventricular fluid communicate with the brain ISF? No. So the ventricular fluid is in the production phase. The ventricular fluid comes down all the way to the cisterns and from the cisterns, the CSF goes up accompanying the vessels and communicating with the brain ISF everywhere. So when the cisternal pressure goes up, these are actually, these, uh, these channels are aquaporin 4 gated, AQP4 gated. But when the pressure in the cistern goes up, so much so that, that you have 50 and about 20 there, you will have fluid shifting massively through these paravascular spaces. It will result in a picture like what I'm going to show you right now. So you're going to, I'm going to show you a picture after that shift. Uh, let's do it in a simple way. This this was the initial picture and the next picture would be no cisterns, brain edema. Uh, I'm sorry, this is not very bigger than this, but Let's, uh, let's make it like that. Let's make it. This becomes big. This becomes big and the cisterns, they have discharged there. So this has become big. But you must understand that the cranial cavity is unyielding. The cranial cavity is unyielding. Let's say, let's put the yellow cranial cavity or uh, let's put a green cranial cavity. Let's put the green cranial cavity there, like that. So, 
this brain becomes edematous, the cisterns disappear and because this brain cannot expand according to Boyle's law, the pressure goes up. When the pressure goes up, the cerebral perfusion pressure comes down and then it will result in all the other problems like uh, ischemia, infarct hmm, and other problems. So this is the proposed mechanism that we are looking at. Now, let's say you have a brain like that, it's, it's edematous, really angry, bursting out, there's not much of cisterns there because the cisterns have already discharged all the fluid into the brain. The solution right now what we do is to make a craniotomy large so that we allow this uh, this brain to come out, herniate out. So, hello. Hello. Here the pressure Hello, comes down. Good afternoon, sir. Here the pressure comes down, but the problem is this brain gets stretched. This brain gets stretched, all the axons get stretched, and once the edema is down, the brain is only half its size, like that, something like that. You see that in a decompressive hemicranic to me that everything collapses because a severe axonal stretch injury, uh, and this is what is usually happening right now. So what we propose So what we are going back to the same stage where you have brain edema, you have cisterns are almost nil, nothing, no cisterns there because the brain is edematous. What we propose was that you open this. So once you open this, the pressure in the cisterns come down and this gradient which had driven the CSF in the first place will reverse and this brain edema comes down. This is what we proposed and we see it during surgery and when you open the cisterns, there's a lot of blood first, there's a lot of blood initially and then once the blood is taken out, you have CSF coming out and the brain edema rapidly comes down. The only difference I have seen in children is that uh, if in adults it is extremely difficult to get into the base, it is ten times more difficult in children to get into the base. How do you do that? How can you get into the base? Well, after we always do a large, uh, really big flap like a decompressive hemicranectomy. And if it is really difficult, if it's very difficult, then we don't even mind sacrificing a bit of uh, orbitofrontal gyrus, maybe uh, one centimeter of uh, strip through which uh, we, we even suck that out so that we get a little bit of space. Once you get into the systems, it's a different story. So uh, the brain, I mean, once we open at the base, we are going to be opening right at the base because after our, uh, in children, we don't do any fancy skull-based manuals because uh, uh, you just take a large decompressive hemicranic to bite as basal as you can and then you just get in here. Instead of doing opening here, you get in here and here is your orbitofrontal gyrus. So when you retract the orbitofrontal gyrus, you are 
you're going to get into the orbitofrontal gyrus and you're going to get into the systems fast. Once you get into the systems, the brain edema is less. Now, uh, the advantage of Google Hangouts is that I can probably stop right now and then I'm going to ask Deepak as to what his view is on this because it's very valuable because uh, I'd like to know as to what is Deepak's view on this. Uh, stop. Uh, well, uh, what you're saying is uh, makes sense and uh, quite understandable. Uh, However, I manage these children uh, a bit different. Uh, I am one of the old-fashioned uh, neurosurgeon, uh, you can say. Uh, this systemostomy mechanism uh, which you are, uh, which you have hypothesized and uh, which you are talking about, it makes sense and uh, well, it, uh, it is true what you are talking about. However, uh, I differ slightly in my approach. Uh, what I do is uh, I give a lot of hypertonic saline uh, to my kids with severe TBI. I don't give any mannitol. I do uh, ICP intra uh, monitoring in all my children with severe TBI. And uh, the thing I do differently is that I put uh, external ventricular drainage in all my children. I have reached uh, a conclusion that it is very, very easy actually to hit the ventricles, even in the swollen brains. You just have to be closer to the midline and being back vertical in front at the coronal suture. So most of the residents are and uh, actually guides me uh, whenever I see some spike of ICP. Instead of giving hypertonic saline, I give I just open the EVD and uh, just continue with the monitoring. So when there are no it hours, then I take off the uh, ISP monitoring. We are a part of a major international uh, study which is called ADAPT study. It's approaches and decisions in acute pediatric TBI. And uh, so we are following uh, the protocols. And now after the institution of the protocolized management of uh, these children, uh, I'm very happy to inform, uh, as per the data being provided to my by research fellow, uh, we lost only six children out of 70 children. That means the mortality in severe TBI was less than 10%, which probably was not heard of. So it really does not require any rocket science to improve the outcome. Uh, you have to stick to the, uh, the protocolized treatment. The other myth which is there in the management of these children, a lot of these people, uh, the neurosurgeons, they usually give even 5% dextrose to these children. I would say uh, for 48 hours actually it is not required. Uh, most of these children can be managed only with the uh, normal saline uh, or hypertonic if required for the outburst. And after 48 hours you start off with the, uh, the, the, the enteral feeds. So these are the very few basic things which we adhere to. I do not have any experience with the systemostomy in the young children. I am being very aggressive uh, in doing uh, decompressives. Uh, if my ICP remains uh, refractory to management uh, with this uh, hypertonic saline and external ventricular drainage. And uh, we don't open the dura in very young children. Less than one year of age, uh, we just uh, take out the bone flap. We don't do any uh, derotomy in less than one year of age. That's it. Uh, systemostomy, I really need to see it further. The results, uh, the surgical videos being coming up uh, to be able to convince myself uh, if I can really do it in the tight range because that remains the apprehension of most of the neurosurgeons all over the world because uh, you need special skills to do it. Uh, IP Cherian cannot be present all over the world uh, to demonstrate. However, uh, he has given a very strong and a very positive message to the world. Uh, and explained it uh, uh, scientifically also. So congratulations, I. But uh, uh, I still have a very very different outcome. In fact, better than any of the centers in the world uh, with protocolized uh, management uh, of these children. And uh, sometime next year, uh, we will come up with uh, discrete guidelines in the management of these children. Uh, uh, once the results of ADAPT study, uh, they actually come out. A word of caution is that 
these uh, you need to tailor made your guidelines uh, as per your local situations so not all centers in the world may not have access to uh, icp monitoring which is quite expensive i would say so one can actually tie it away by doing some external ventricular drainage in such children uh, that's my my take home on uh, management of these children i uh i for you are mute here uh, i you are you are mute still my i there you go yeah see uh what deepak said is uh, absolutely right uh, i would agree with deepak on a lot of things in fact uh, as he said you don't require rocket rocket science to uh, save these children and uh, of course uh, the results in children are much much better than in adults uh, that's something that's something we have seen too uh but the the theory that i just uh, i just highlighted this is what we believed in and i understand that sometimes yes uh, i mean uh i would wish that i could give uh, i mean retrospectively sometimes i have wished that maybe uh, a hypotonic saline would have helped or uh, even sometimes mannitol would have helped uh having but having said that now decompressive hemicrinic to me uh we have done for quite a lot of children I mean, when i was in velor as well as when i when i was in a consultant in kerala uh, and even in nepal we have done a lot of decompressive hemicrinic for children and they do very well and they come back for the cranioplasty as well uh but what i have seen is the loss of brain the loss of brain which means the atrophy uh, is much more in decompressive hemicrinic mean compared to uh the systems that we see so this is something i would like to put it into the box notice and the other thing as as he said uh the 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 trials and and the data coming out and uh yes we completely agree to that because this is evidence based medicine uh another thing is you know uh as he rightly pointed out during times of trauma uh you you really don't uh, get a surgeon with vascular experience uh, um, or i mean for to operate at during that time so if you have to open the cisterns uh compared to uh, just a decompressive hemicrinic to me this is going to be extremely extremely difficult so you're talking about a very easy surgery which gives reasonable results in children and a uh, extremely difficult surgery which gives a little bit more better results we not in children we not talking about a radical difference in adults yes i would tell that i would not accept the compulsory hemicrinectomy because the results the difference in results are radical but i have seen it's not that i have not seen the compulsory hemicrinectomy uh children doing pretty well i mean uh, i don't disagree with deepak there so yes it is what you have to sacrifice is uh, a lot of uh, i mean the cons for this surgery would be a lot of equipment a lot of expertise and learning curve and the advantage would be a slightly more a slightly better outcome in terms of brain atrophy i would like to ask deepak as to what he thinks about this i think uh it's a unending discussion i would say uh regarding cystinostomy whether versus decompressives i must uh, accept that uh, i'm not very comfortable with the decompressive pinectomy per se and uh, because uh, now over a period of time i have started observing uh, sequelae of decompressive pinectomy both in the adult and the children so i do try to avoid it as much as possible and as i said uh, believe me uh, with very simple means very simple means of putting in extra the giving first line therapy to this children external ventricular drainage head and elevation no neck kinks uh, avoiding uh, doing tracheal suction endotracheal tube suction with proper uh, anesthesia or xylocaine spray locally if you are able to tide away the first 3 to 4 days lots and lot of this children they can be uh, you know avoided uh either the decompressive or cystinostomy so believe me medical management holds a very very strong role 
uh, in the management of these children because lots and lots of these children they you can avoid doing surgeries. However, till the time uh, people learn uh, the tricks of uh, cystinostomy, uh, I would not uh, vouch for it. I would say uh, it is better to be uh, as simple in uh, acute trauma settings, especially when the residents are operating without any adequate training uh, as possible because uh, the TBI management in acute care setting is all a uh, kind of a game of uh, being simple and being quick. Uh, thank you, Deepak. I would like to show you, show a single slide right now. So we, I have probably I have five minutes left. So I would like to show uh, just uh, a single slide. You have more than five minutes. Sorry. Can I? I'm sharing the screen, uh, John. Okay. <laughs> Not yet. Yes, I'm, I'm sharing right now. Not yet. Okay, okay. Can you see that slide? Yes. Yes. Oh. Proposed mechanism, CAT scan. Right. right. Uh, so this is the child uh, who came to us with a modest score of five. I uh, I don't really remember what his other scores was. Motor score was five when he came to the cash out. When he came to the emergency, his motor score was five. And then we were doing rounds, and then we were finishing rounds, and then they suddenly call us. They suddenly call us saying that the motor score has dropped to two. He's just uh, decelerating. So we went into the casualty with this scan. I had to take him into the OT. So if you look at this scan, it's not so bad actually. Uh, the, the only thing you would find is that hypodensity in this basal region. In this basal region, uh, you once you look at the cisterns, the cisterns are very well, very well seen. Uh, there is no evidence of widening of this CP angle cistern or any subfall sign herniation um, or truncation of brain stem. So, I. Uh, you know, I was uh, puzzled as to what was the reason why this child started decelerating. Now, this is the immediate post-op scan, and uh, you see the reason. Uh, I I don't know how this how the scan looked when he was taken into theater because we had to take him to theater with that initial scan. But you can see here there is absolutely no cisterns seen. Nothing is seen. If you see the basal region. There's nothing seen. And you can see this hypodensity is extended to the other side also. So we took him into theater. We, uh, we op I mean, the dura was uh, stone tense. So we uh, opened the dura and the base, and then you had brain coming out like that. And then we get, got into the cisterns. Um, after some time, the CSF was drained out. The, the brain became much more lax. We put in a drain. You can see this drain into the prepondine cistern. And uh, um, we waited for some time. The brain was not coming up, so we put the bone flap back there, and then we came up. So this is how the immediate post-op scan looked like. It's not very good. So, but as Deepak says, uh, once this patient survives, they do pretty well. And this is at the end of uh, uh, six weeks, and that's the guy. Uh, at the end of six weeks, I have another video uh, showing. This guy coming for a follow-up is uh, is talking, walking, and uh, even going to school right now. So uh, that's just one. I mean, it's just a one-off uh, slide uh, showing that we, uh, you know, the decompressive hemic. We did not do the decompressive hemic. This this was pretty bad because this was drastic because uh, this patient came in like that, and this is how he was, you know, uh, just prior to surgery, and this is immediately after surgery. So uh, I wanted to know whether Deepak has seen uh, cases where he, you have a sudden deterioration. I'm taking off the screen sharing. Uh, I, am, I, am I off the screen sharing now? Yes, you are. Yes. So I wanted to see what is uh, his opinion on uh, cases where uh, you know these children come and they suddenly deteriorate, even when you're conservatively managing. And they have you had experiences with cases where they suddenly deteriorate, and when you take them to theater, you find this massively, massively demanding brain. 
Oh yes, uh, oh, yes. Unusual. and uh, there comes the importance of uh, monitoring these children and that's why I said uh, for me uh, I am one of the strong believers of ICP monitoring. Uh, I do keep intra-parent camel and EVT both in place for my children and uh, it really guides me, number one. Number two, uh, the patient which you showed, the first scan uh, actually was not good, I would say, the scan was bad because this child had got large frontotemporal contusions uh, on the right side. And uh, I believe uh, that's what I talk about, uh, contused brain is a very, very dangerous brain because they can swell any time. These, uh, children of, uh, these children and even the adults, they have got uh, so-called uh, subclinical uh, uh, seizures. Uh, uh, and the way uh, uh, you had brain coming out like that, and then we get, got into the systems, um, after some time, the season was drained okay, out. Uh, the and the previous video is being much more lax. Yeah, no, no, turn around, you have to turn your uh, computer on. Oh, no, turn and, around, you uh, have to mute, please. Drained for some time, the brain is not coming your, up. Your, your screen. So bone flat, flat there, and then we can mute. So, and this is how the post ops can look like. It's not very good. So, but as Deepak says, uh, once this is a video lag, time lag. Now, turn around, you have to mute, please. At the end of uh, uh, six weeks, okay. Dr. Mukherjee, can you do uh, 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 because uh, this patient came in like that, video. and this okay. is how he was. Okay, well. Uh, just. Okay, very good. Okay, okay, perfect. very good. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I, uh, what I was telling you was, I mean, uh, the contused brain is a dead brain, and uh, these are the biggest culprits, I would say. Uh, if the in the burst temporal lobes or the burst uh, uh, frontal lobes, they usually have got associated acute subdural hematomas. And uh, this phenomena of osmotic gradients exist, and uh, these are the brains. They swell very, very rapidly within six hours, or in fact, much more earlier than them. So my philosophy is completely different. I believe in taking out the contused or the dead brain. It causes no harm because that brain is already damaged. And uh, along with that, if I am comfortable and uh, if I can do, I will definitely open the cisterns uh, uh, within my acceptable uh, surgical uh, limitations and if some resident is there. So this uh, phenomena of acute deterioration uh, in patients of severe traumatic brain injury does happen, does exist and at some times uh, these are causes are purely medical and uh, yes these patients do throw seizures which are subclinical, they are not picked up and that is one of the mechanisms of uh, rapid deterioration. Uh, thank you, Deepak. Yeah, I mean, that is what I would like to have talked to. Uh, tomorrow I'll be talking on uh, the mechanisms of uh, uh, systemostomy again, uh, along with the cooling and cleaning functions as well. Uh, hello? Can you hear me? Yes. yes, I can hear you. Yes, we can hear you. Uh, tomorrow I'll be talking on the, the uh, the CSF shifted image as well as the cooling and cleaning, cleaning functions, which are very important in the um, in the perspective of uh, the system It's not very good. So, but as Deepak says, uh, once this equation is there, right? Turn around, you have to mute, please. Okay. At the end of the video. Someone's playing a recording of the video. That's right. Yeah. Turn around, please. Okay. Okay. There you go. Okay. Okay. Sorry about that. All right then, thank you. Okay. Uh, can you hear? Can you hear? Okay. Okay. Very good. Okay. Okay. Very good. Uh, so, uh, I, uh, what I was telling you was, I mean, uh, the contused brain is a dead brain. 
and uh, these are the biggest culprits i okay okay i okay you, you need to unmute right unmute i didn't i'll just uh, Natanaran, can you hear me? Okay. Okay, well said. I, you can unmute now. I can hear you, John. I can hear you. Okay, good. Okay, I, I just have a question, uh, partly from a non-neurosurgeon. Why, uh, you mentioned that results with children is better than adults with cystinostomy, and, and why, why is that, do you think? Well, I believe that this is because of the plasticity of the brain, uh, because children are, take, are able to take uh, a much more uh, bad abuse to the brain and then come out completely okay compared to an adult. So um, if you, I mean, I have seen a lot of children where I did not have much hope after decompressing or cystinostomy, but uh, after six months I was amazed to see them that uh, they have done much better. And I'm sure Deepak also uh, being in a place where he sees a lot of head injuries, you would have seen this. You know, in Nepal, we get a lot of uh, pediatric head injuries because they usually fall off uh, heights and uh, uh, because we have a lot of hilly regions around. So they, they fall off from the heights and uh, we have a lot of traffic accidents. So most of these uh, would be just fractures and, uh, you know, um, uh, depressed fractures and things. But uh, we have a lot of these... Uh, head injuries also, as Gaurav would know, that uh, we have a lot of these head injuries which sometimes require uh, cystinostomy. So I'm sure Deepak also would have uh, seen that uh, the, the, the amount of insult that a pediatric brain can take is much, much more. And they, they come out pretty okay. And they come out uh, almost normal. So and that's, that's why I, I, I'm, I, I mean it's the same with us that uh, the the mortality and morbidity is uh, much better in uh, terms of pediatric head injuries compared to uh, adult head injuries. Hi, uh, we are joined uh, by uh, Professor N. Muthu He is a professor of uh, uh, neurosurgery in Madurai Medical College in Madurai. Uh, professor Muthu Kumar, welcome to this forum. Uh, we can see you well. I hope uh, you can hear us very well. Uh, we are Hi, having yeah. a we are having a discussion, sir, on uh, pediatric traumatic brain injury. And uh, mm -hmm. IP just uh, finished his talk on them. And uh, right now we are just discussing uh, how, uh, why uh, the outcome is better in the children as compared to the adults. Sir. So we, it's just a didactic uh, uh, thing going on. What are your thoughts on that? I just, just a couple of minutes I joined the discussion. So I don't think it would be appropriate for me to just jump in with the suggestion. So I should have listened to the at least a part of the lecture. So. Maybe okay. we can proceed okay. with your question. Okay. All right. But okay. uh, but may I ask you uh, how differently you uh, how you manage your children? Do you do ICP monitoring uh, in your children, or do you uh, give mannitol, hypertonic saline to your children? Or uh, do you have any protocols in your setup, sir? As as of now, we don't have any fixed protocol, but uh, we generally are not great enthusiasts of uh, hypertonic saline. I I am still a manitol man, and uh, we do not routinely use ICP monitoring in our setup because mostly not because we don't believe in that, but because uh, of the financial constraints that uh, plague any developing developer, developing country like us. So that's the main reason we, we, for which we don't use ICP. Thank you. We are joined by Dr. S. Varkanath. Uh, he is a pro professor of neurosurgery in uh, Nimhans, which is a very high volume trauma center in southern part of India. Welcome, Dwarkana. Dwarka, can you hear us? Uh, you have to unmute. We cannot hear you, Dwarka. We cannot hear you. Well, we cannot. I, I don't think he's muted. I think it's a problem with the audio. The audio is not coming, Dwarka. Yeah. Well, yeah, he is. Okay, yeah. Okay, go ahead. Talk. You can talk now. We cannot hear you. Okay. Uh, okay, I think... Uh, one I, one last talk. question. We have we have uh, some time. So one last question I may ask to, okay. to Professor okay. Muthu Kumar. Sure. Uh, uh, how often... Uh, 
does he get a CT scan in the children with minor head injury? I mean, are, what are the children he does not advise uh, doing a CT scan? See, I think uh, way back about 10 years ago, there was a World Health Organization uh, subcommittee that provided guidelines for uh, uh, CT scan in head injury. That was not specifically meant for children, but then I think uh, overall for all children, anything less than GCS 40 or other criteria which includes the presence of any loss of consciousness, ENT bleeding, seizures, or severe vomiting, severe headache, when there's a um, skull fracture, I mean, a plane radiograph shows a skull fracture, all these children get a CT scan. But the situation in our place is that now people are so much concerned about the uh, consequences of head injury that many a time, even when we feel that the, that the child might not be in a city, if the parents would, for their own for personal reasons, for their psychological satisfaction, would like to have a CT scan done. That's, a, that's something that is, uh, um, you have to concede to their anxiety, isn't it? That's a, some sort of anxiety on the part of the parent that the, the child might have some lot of consequences of head injury. So many of them, in fact, they do, by the time they reach the neurosurgeon, they have already got a CT scan. It's really surprising. And uh, in my state of Tamil Nadu, CT scan centers are available in all district hospitals. And any patient anywhere in Tamil Nadu can access a CT facility within 45 minutes or uh, on an average 30 minutes. So yeah, nowadays, uh, quite, the night guidelines. Yeah. So nowadays, we, have, we do have uh, nice guidelines which have been revised for. Uh, and for the indications of CT scan. However, one can always do a low dose CT scan and uh, in case you've got facilities available, some centers, people like to do MRI also in children to get away uh, from the radiation risk to the children. But uh, the NICE guidelines are very apt enough uh, to, in fact, most of the gu guidelines you've actually enumerated uh, in just a few seconds back on uh, when to do CT scan and when not to do CT scan. Thank you, Professor Muttu Kumar. Dwarka, can you hear us? I mean, um, hello, welcome to the group, Dwarka. OK, OK, I think we need to wrap this uh, presentation up. I, okay. I agree. Thank you very much. I'm sure we continue. We could continue for another hour. Uh, but let's uh, wrap this up uh, before we prepare for the next talk. So thank you, everyone, for coming. And we'll sign off now. Thank you.